today I'm with uh, Noel Hayes in his home here in Castle Ward in County Kildare. Thanks for taking the time to chat to me today, Noel. Thanks, Sarah. You're very welcome. Now, we will go into more detail about your new venture later on, but I do want to uh, run through it really um, briefly. So, about your new business called Sunday. How did you get um, into this new business, Noel? Well, I suppose Sunday is a brainchild uh, of myself and my business partner, Darren McGrath. Um, why did we create it? I guess my background is obviously 10 years in the betting industry, so I would recognise that you know, there's probably 10 million people have placed a bet in horse racing online between the UK and Ireland in the last five years. Darren's background, he had a business in Dublin called Brando, and his business was branding, marketing, advertising, and creative. And he would have you know, done a lot of the tier one uh, advertising creative for, for, for large companies. So we had a shared common passion of horse racing, and I guess we understood that um, that people's participation in horse racing was largely centered around uh, gambling and that horse racing was nearly an outlier in that regard. You know, people can enjoy golf for golf's sake, people can enjoy rugby without having a bet, but it seemed like people couldn't enjoy horse racing without the need to have a bet. So we thought that there must be an opportunity there to you know, bring people to a different place and enjoy horse racing for horse racing sake, rather than have the enjoyment of horse racing linked to the outcome of a bet. Okay. Now, just to give everyone an idea of who Noel Hayes is, I know you love to travel and you love to cook, but your main um, passion is horse racing. So where did your love for it come from? Yeah, I, kind of, I guess I kind of grew up in horse racing. I come from a small town in Alfield called Banner, uh, with that at a butcher shop. And, um, you know, is an, you know, a couple of acres to finish the cattle for, for, for the shop, I guess. And as any small rural farmer does, to buy themselves a mare, and uh, they start uh, blowing money and breeding horses. So I guess my uh, introduction really came from my dad. My dad had a passion for, for horse racing that would have originated through betting, it has to be said. But uh, his passion and interest in horse racing really rubbed off on me. He would have been a regular race scorer and I would always get to go along in the car. Um, you know, there was a couple of days as a kid, I, was, uh, I had a fictitious dental appointments in order to go to Turles on a Thursday or the Thiastis Chase Day. It was one of the years, one of the days every year that I always got to go to as well. So. I can certainly uh, lay the blame squarely at the feet of my father. Okay, so you have also um, been um, a commercial director of Tote Ireland. You have been a director of Betbright and um, head of Boyle Sports Sportsbook. So how did you become so successful so quickly and move up the ladder for such a, a young man like yourself? <laughs> I don't know if I've been successful. They all chucked me out the door. Um, I started off in a career, I haven't done a master's in finance, I started off in, in corporate banking with AIB and um, I kind of figured that corporate banking wasn't for me and um, I left one day with no job uh, picked out. My timing was immaculate because a couple of weeks later the whole bust came in the banking industry but luckily in between I'd secured a job with Paddy Power. Um, this was in the middle of 2007 when Paddy Power was still substantially a retail business. Um, and they were transitioning from being a retail business to online. And I spent three and a half years there with Paddy Power. And during that time with Paddy Power, uh, Paddy Power changed from being a retail business into being an online bookmaker that also had some retail shops. And it was an incredible learning environment. You know, you, you, you got to live in a reasonably small team, you know, about 200 people, I guess, at the time, but you got to live through a massive sea change for a business. And it was the early steps and the foundation of what is now an unbelievable business. And Patrick Kennedy was CEO at the time, and um, you know, he was a very communicator in terms of staff communication as well. And I remember one of the messages he gave one day to staff was that we were going to Paddy Power was going to succeed, um, because technology would enable that succession. And I didn't really understand it at the time, but I lived through the understanding over the pre over the next couple of years. And what I really understood was that. Business is all about uh, product and customer. So I would say that you take a product focused, customer centric approach. Product is not just what you sell, it's how you sell it. And you put the customer at the heart of everything you do and you, take, you make decisions and take decisions in the best interest of the customer. So I think that holds true for Paddy Power and holds true for anywhere else I went and that's the, the kind of the approach I try to bring. But I think what do you, if you have a restaurant, you have a corner cafe, you have a news agent, it doesn't really make a difference. It's all about the product, it's all about the customer, it's all about good quality and it's about doing, you know, putting your customer at the heart of your business. And I guess I learned that in Paddy Power. And, you know, how did I move on to those other jobs? 
Paddy Power were kind of the front runners. They were the most successful business in the industry, in a, in a growing and changing industry. So the other firms were obviously naturally looking for people that had the experience of having worked in Paddy Power during those times. So I was only one of many, many people that left Paddy Power and I suppose went on you know, great and exciting career paths because of the opportunity really that, that, that came from, from having good time, I guess, and being in Paddy Power at the right time. Okay, and what about your time in, in Betbright? You only finished up with them um, last year before you started your new venture. Betbright were wonderful. I mean, like Marcus Brennan is the CEO, and I swear to God, um, the vision that the man had uh, with zero background in bookmaking to create Betbright. I mean, the guy sat down and went, what industry is ripe for this disruption? What industry needs a shake-up? And he figured out that that industry was gambling and betting. And the approach they've taken in terms of Technology ownership, it was the same exact same thing that Patrick Kennedy was preaching many moons ago when I was in Pat and Paddy Powers. Was technology ownership, you know, deliver, put your customer at the heart of what you want to do. Um, so it was really exciting actually to work there. And, and you know, I'm sorry to have left, but I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I have great fondness for the team there that, that uh, would have left behind. And uh, I'm excited to, to, you know, to see them succeed because I'm no doubt they will. You've got some really, really, really smart people in, in that operation. And you know, when you look particularly from a product perspective and see some of the innovations that they deliver from product, um, game changing stuff. I think if it was delivered by Paddy Bauer, or Betri 65 or somebody else, it would get all the headlines. But obviously when you're tier two stroke tier three bookmaker, it's harder to, to get the, the, uh, the recognition for, for, for those sort of efforts. But um, great place, great people in there as well. I'm following the journey from, from the outside now. Great stuff. Okay, so have you any views on um, exposure, a pun punter's exposure? So what have you learned from all the different firms that you've worked for over the years? Well, from a punting perspective uh, and looking at punters, um, if I was to take one thing and give one piece of advice to, to, to punters today is that they have too many bets. Um, you, winning is easy, losing is hard. And Learning how to lose is also difficult, and that's probably the thing that most customers don't understand, is they don't understand how to lose. And what I've often said and had conversations with different risk managers in, in business I've worked in that, you know, a customer is a danger to the business when that customer is in control. However, customers don't remain in control for long. They, they get an emotional switch. A, a horse that backed falls at the last. It gets beaten, caught on the line, having traded at 1.01. Um, the jockey, loses his whip, something stupid, but that's like an emotional trigger in a punter's head and they go from being in control and winning to chasing, you know, having bets for bad reasons. So like if I encapsulate all of that into, into one piece of advice that I can take having looked at it from the operator side is I would tell punters to have much less bets. And when I say less bets, punters should probably have less than 10% of the amount of bets that they're currently having. Okay. So as an observer from the industry side, what are the mistakes that punters are making um, in, in, in relation to restricted accounts, for example? Yeah, well, I suppose the mistakes they're making is, is uh, you know, as I've just kind of said, it's, it's just have less bets. You know, the topic of restricted accounts is, is a, it's an interesting one. Um, and, you know, I'm entirely comfortable with the, the industry's position on it. The first thing is that the problem is nowhere near as big as people believe it to be. Um, and the, 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 the reason that, that people think this is a much bigger problem than it is, is that one, people love to tell you they've had a restricted account. I remember the first time I had an account restricted, I think I told somebody that it was like shaving. It was cool at first, but it soon became a nuisance. <laughs> okay? um, you know, it, you feel good, you're, you're kind of, your decisions are being vindicated, you're starting out, and you're, you're obviously on an arc as a punter that you must be improving on what you're doing. And you kind of you puff your chest out and go, that, that firm is afraid of me, they've restricted my account. But what people need to realize is that you curate your own Twitter uh, newsfeed. And Twitter is the predominant source uh, of news for people. So if you curate your own newsfeed of like minded people, you're going to have people who, are, who say they have accounts restricted. I've seen estimations of up to 10% of accounts restricted. I mean, that is completely overestimating it by a very, very significant portion. Less than a half a percent of accounts in the industry are restricted. Um, I would probably even go to say less than a quarter of a percent of accounts in the industry are restricted. 
Does it infect some people? Yes, it does. But my advice to people is, don't spend energy on things you can't change. So you can't get that account reopened, okay? So don't be spending your energy on Twitter whinging and moaning about it. Spend your energy wondering how you're gonna beat the system, get around that restriction, and get your bets on if you've got profitable bets to place. So, you know, don't, 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 don't complain about it, don't overstate the issue, and just really, I would say, forget about it. Learn a new way because you can't change that. The switch to racing TV. So I want to talk about that. Have you any thoughts or, or, or opinions um, on the, the at the races switch as well? Yeah, this is, a, this is a hell of an interesting topic at the minute. And I think when it was announced, first of all, I was probably one of the people on Twitter saying, calm down people, you know, let's wait and see what happens and let's understand um, what it looks like. Because I have obviously from an operator side have dealt with the guys in Racing UK, Racing TV, I've dealt with the guys in other races. These are incredibly capable professional people. Right? Racing UK are after spending a significant amount of money to purchase the media rights for Irish racing. They've not spent that money to kind of leave it sit on the shelf. They now have an IP, they now have an asset that they need to sell and that they need to distribute. So you need this to say they're going to be taking all measures possible to distribute that asset. Um, so that's going to be the race in the UK side of things. You know, give them a chance, take a breath. We have problems at the minute with the archive. All right, that'll all work itself out in the next few weeks. There's a bit of uh, um, brinksmanship uh, at play uh, over data sharing on both sides there at the minute. But that'll all work its way out in a couple of weeks. And in two years' time, okay, we're going to look back and we'll forget that the archive wasn't there for, for a month. It's a temporary nuisance. Okay, we'll get off now. The broader topic of racing TV and ra Irish racing going behind a paywall is an issue, I feel. So like, what's the motivation for the business that I'm creating with my business partner, Darren? It's access. You know, if we were to give one term to describe our motivation, our motivation is to give people access to racing, all right? Now, what does giving people access to something do? It allows them to immerse themselves into that sport. It allows them to participate. Now, what Irish racing authorities have done is that they've removed access for the greater public to racing. That is a problem, okay? Because where are the punters from three years' time going to come from? Where are the racehorse owners for 10 years' time going to come from? If you think of this and from a marketing perspective, and you think of this in terms of a conversion funnel, you generate interest out of here, and at the tip of that funnel, you get participation, okay? What we've just done is that we've closed the top of the funnel on racing very, very significantly. So we are creating a problem now that's gonna manifest itself in five, 10, 15 years time. Now, if we deal with the issue alone of the fact that it's gone behind the payroll, or behind the paywall, well, that, that bird has flown the coop because what's going to happen here is, right? The prior, prior existence for At The Races was free to air TV, all right? And Sky owning that didn't charge for it necessarily in the same way as they would charge for Sky Sports 1 for your, your Monday Night Football game. Racing TV have purchased the media rights and part of their purchasing of the media rights is going to be, we will get X more subscriptions at Y cost Therefore, we can outbid at the races at the table when we're looking to purchase these rights. So they've done that and they've put it behind the paywall. So whether it's in four years time or eight years time, so as in one contract cycle or two contract cycles, racing in Ireland is going to go back to at the races or sky racing as it is now. And the reason is, is because when it goes back to sky racing, sky racing already have it enabled for it to be behind the paywall and the acceptance for racing behind the paywall will already exist. So Sky will now be able to go back to the bidding table in four years time or eight years time, or in the next cycle, and they'll be able to bid more because they're now gonna say we can put it behind the paywall. So the reality is, I would say with almost certainty that Irish racing is gonna be behind the payroll for the rest of its, its natural life. And again, going back to it, that is a mega issue for Irish racing because where are the future participants from the sport going to come from? Where are the owners going to come from? Where are the race cars going to come from? Where are they going to build that interest in horse racing if it's not from free-to-air TV? So it's a big problem, okay? 
The quote is that it was a decision that was made in the best commercial interest of Irish racing. I don't believe so because it seems like a very um, singular view. You know, that, that commercial interest seems to be a very singular view. And that singular view seems to be who was willing to write the biggest check at a point in time to buy those media rights. The holistic view is what's racing going to look like in five years' time, in 10 years' time, in 15 years' time, what's participation Irish racing going to look like. And the reality is, is betting companies don't care, okay? Betting companies just want to get people in and bet. They don't care if they're betting on horse racing or football or cricket or virtuals, right? So horse racing might be the gateway, but it, it you know, betting companies don't need horse racing in 20 years time, like horse racing thinks Ben Company needs horse racing in, 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 in 20 years time. And our funding model for racing in Ireland is predicated on media rights. And it's going to become a less valuable commodity into the future. And as it reduces in value, the participation from the general public is also going to reduce. And it's a fairly uh, dangerous looking death spiral is what I would call it. It might take a long time for it to come to pass, but in 15 and 20 years, when Irish racing is suffering, and probably suffering in the same manner in which the Irish Greyhound Board has suffered in the last couple of years, um, it will, you know, the reason for that suffering will rest at the decisions that were made in the past 12 months uh, for the awarding of the, the, the media rights to Racing UK, or I should say for the awarding of media rights to Racing UK to put it behind the paywall. R racing UK will do a brilliant job broadcasting it, I have little doubt, they're professionals at this. But the fact that it's behind the paywall is the issue. With all that in mind, no, how can we or yourself or Dream Adventure encourage young people to get into this sport? Well, again, like that's why we've created Sunday. Sunday is access. And like there were, we did a lot of research when we were starting on the journey to create Sunday. We did some focus groups and, and whatnot. And one of the pieces of feedback we got from the focus groups uh, was from a guy who said, um, I feel part of the betting club. It's fun. I don't feel part of racing. Okay? So, I'll go back to something I said earlier on. People's enjoyment of racing is linked to the outcome of a bet. That is not good for the future of racing. Okay? Now you can look at any other sport. You can look at what Sky have done for football, cricket, golf, um, rugby, GAA even. Okay? They've changed how uh, it's been broadcast. But racing has never changed. Racing... The conversation on racing is always this horse was six to one, it's now four to one, why don't you have a bet? Okay? In golf, if you know, as I said, if Dustin Johnson sticks one into the trees, you're back to the studio and Butch Harmon is staring down the lens with a club in his hand, he's telling you that he's dropped his hip and he didn't score his club face at impact. It means little, but the, you know it's the it's the whiffing, it's the what's in it for me. The, the actually the person at the other end side of that TV feels like they're enriched by that. They've learned something by that. When you learn something and you feel enriched, your propensity to engage in that is far higher. But we're, racing is not giving the, the general public the opportunity to engage, or the tools to engage. Now, we're a speck of dust in the grand scheme of what racing is, but our motivation on Sunday is to actually educate people and bring people on the journey. And it's like a three-step phase, it's educate, engage, involve. Start with the education. If people understand what's happening, they're going to engage with it more. When people engage with it more, they're going to get involved with it more. So that's kind of our motivation. Are you a betting man, Noel? And what difficulties have you faced as a punter? Yeah, I'm a betting man. I probably would tell you that uh, I, I, I probably have a reasonably typical story arc when it comes to betting. When I was younger and foolish, I enjoyed to bet, didn't really know what I was at. Um, started to figure out, well, if you're going to be at that, you better get good at it. So you start to invest your time and resource in it. You get good at it. Um, you know, as I said, all your accounts get restricted and you just kind of lose interest in it. Um, I probably, you know, have 1% of the bets now that I would have had 10 years ago. And I probably turn over 10 times the amount of money, if you know what I mean. So like, I've changed. Um, it goes back to there's no point in complaining about not getting on. So you need to just be more selective and you need to just find you know find your methodologies for getting on and you need to understand really how to match your conviction for a selection to your staking pattern and um, you know there's some guys out there and whether they get a, whether they read it off the newspaper or the owner tells them that i've actually you're about to watch the replay of the race this horse has already won they'll have a tenner on it you know that's just wrong i'll, I'll happily have 
tenner on a horse uh, you know what I mean for, for interest sake um, but I'll happily have five figures on a horse as well um, if I you know if I think that that's the sort of stake, stake that's required for it so I've completely changed how I bet um, I'm probably a very small marginal winner um, you know but that's fine it's not costing me money to participate um, certainly much better off now than when I was having multiples more bets you know thinking I was enjoying it more but the difference is when you're having you know when you're at the early stage of your journey of being of, of enjoying betting you're being sold something you know so it's passive it's reactive you're seeing an advert on tv that says have a bet now you're reacting to somebody telling you giving you a tip you see a horse racing today that you backed a few weeks ago and he was in a lucky second so you've just feared missing out so you're you know what i mean you're reactive and you're being sold something the difference to i think if you want to change to try and be a successful hunter is that you want to be active and in control so you have a bet for your reasons those reasons should be the outcome of a critical thought process your own work and you you're purchasing something rather than being sold something and i think when you're purchasing something um you know you've you've got the upper hand Okay, now just to, to finish up in part one, um, I want to talk about the whip ban. Now I know you're going to delve deeper into it uh, during the betting forum that's on January the 19th in Leopardstown, but what are your views on the whip ban? The whip uh, is a necessary tool. Um, the whip is not a welfare issue of any, um, you know, on any scale whatsoever. Uh, it's a padded instrument and it has use and racing is pandering to people who don't understand and who don't want to understand. Their minds will never ever be changed. So changing to suit people, um, you know, changing to suit people who have no interest in the longevity of your sport or the future of your sport is not doing anything for the sport's benefit. Um, I find it disappointing that certain media outlets seem to have an anti-whip agenda particularly when they should be, you know, on racing's inside. Um, but basically, you can't please everybody, so don't try. So trying to please people who don't understand and don't want to understand is not the, the, the path forward in my view. Okay, thanks, Mel. Thanks very much, Sarah.